You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to Convenience Matters. My name is John Eichberger with the Fuels Institute Nax, and I am joined here with my colleague, Donovan Woods, also with the Fuels Institute. And this is a program where we talk about everything that powers you, powers your body, powers your vehicle. And today we're going to focus on what powers your mobility. We're going to talk to Denton Sinkograna with the Oil Price Information Service. And Donovan, we're going to ask him you know, what he thinks about the future of oil markets. Are we going to go above $60 barrel oil? If we do, what's going to cause that? What are the factors that might implicate the uh, in, uh, influence, the you know, future d- direction of oil prices? And ultimately, what is the impact of oil prices on consumers and the uh introduction of alternative fuel vehicles. So, Denton, thank you very much for joining us on Convenience Matters. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. You know, before we get started on this and uh, start talking about oil prices and markets and stuff, you know, a lot of the audience might be going, who is this guy and why should we be listening to him? So, can you give us a little bit of background on what Opus is and what your role at Opus is and your background so they know whether or not to actually believe what you have to say? Sure. Well, at Opus, we're uh, one of the key providers of, of prices uh, for, for refined products from a refinery all the way down to the retail level. Um, you know, a lot of our wholesale prices and spot prices are used to settle out contracts, uh, set prices for the day. So, um, you know, we, we run when we run the gamut from the refinery all the way down to the retail level and prices that are uh, widely referenced throughout the industry. Uh, me personally, uh, my title here is uh, chief oil analyst. So I kind of give the 10,000 thousand foot views of, of oil oil markets, supply and demand, and retail market trends and, and market trends in wholesale as well. So watching everything from refinery operations to domestic oil production and uh, supply and demand. You know, Donovan, I've been using Opus now for my analysis of the market. Well, uh, since I started with NAX in the early 2000s, I actually have a database with their weekly reported uh, price yep. of gasoline from January 2006. Every week updated on a spreadsheet. So when we start looking at what's going on in the market, I have that available to look at. And so you guys are, provide great information on the market and really help us understand what's going on. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, no, look forward to uh, continuing that relationship for sure. You know, it's funny. I, I'm happy to know that there's more than one employee at Opus besides Tom Closer. Uh, <laughs> so is everybody else. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so. So good to hear from you, Denton. Thanks again for being with us. No, now, of course, anytime. John mentioned a lot about the data you provide. Uh, we've used it for some of our reports, looking at the market over the years, over the months, the breakdown. How does a typical retailer, what value would they find in using a service like Opus or why would they look to Opus? I think the typical retailer would use us to just get a look at what their competition's doing. Uh, we have several reports and, and several services that uh, can look, you know, instead of sending out your manager to drive around the neighborhood or drive around the uh, markets that you're involved in and looking for prices and writing them down, we have services that could just kind of zap you over the, the prices of, of all your competitors and you can make your uh, pricing decisions from there. Additionally, we have other uh, services that, that look at uh, gasoline demand uh, on very local levels. And, um, you know, some of the other things we look at is, um, you know, how a brand performs in, in certain regions and everything. So with, with the wealth of data we do have, we could do a lot of different things and, and package them in a lot of different ways. So let's take this to the area you self-described as a 25,000-foot level. So I spend a lot of time at NAX and the Fuels Institute kind of just thinking about stuff. It's kind of cool. My job is to think about stuff, write some stuff down, and then tell people what I thought. Um, but I'll sit down and I'll talk to the research department at NAX and I'll go, you know, one of the biggest threats to the convenience retail channel is anything that may end to $2.50 gasoline. <clears throat> if you think about it, when gasoline is really expensive, people shop around like crazy. They don't have as much money to spend inside the store. When gas is stable to two twenty five, we have not seen a whole lot of people driving around looking for the best price. The demand for alternative engines and alternative fuels has dis- has really waned the last couple of years, and people are happier and they're spending a lot more money in the store. So the big question is, what is on the horizon that might threaten a stable, low-priced gasoline market in the United States? I think one of the things you would look at is obviously geopolitics, which have become a little bit more uh, important here in 2017 as OPEC and non-OPEC producers have kind of gotten together and agreed to take some oil off the market to help uh, you know, rebalance supply and demand. Uh, the market has become a little bit more sensitive to those, those types of issues compared to, say, maybe at the beginning of 2016 when you were reading about obviously bloated supplies here in the U.S. and, and in other 
developed nations, but also besides that, one of the rare occurrences that you saw, uh, you know, th- throughout the t- throughout 2016, not so much in 2017, but uh, oil tankers just sitting there as use- being used as uh, floating storage, if you will, that's kind of disappeared. So the market has become a bit more sensitive to the geopolitics, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, fighting in northern Iraq or, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of power struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran in the region. Uh, one One kind of factor that's that would have more on the opposite side of, of things where it would have more of an impact on demand is kind of war of words between the North Koreans and, and the United States. Uh, if, if there was some sort of uh, military action out there, it would have more of an impact on demand. South Korea has become a nice little kind of pocket of growing demand uh, from a global sense. So any sort of military actions happening there would have kind of more an impact on demand. But most of the geopolitical issues right now are coming from the supply side and the market has become a bit more sensitive to those. Because the last time uh, in the past growing up in this industry when OPEC said we're going to cut production we always kind of went yeah right you guys cheat Mm -hmm. left and right but it seems like there have been much more committed to a uh, agreed upon approach to supply controls hasn't haven't they? Yeah, you're absolutely right, John. I mean, they have been, and again, like you, I, when they say we're going to cut, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're like, yeah, show me. They have been incredibly disciplined with this pr- production cut. Um, at times, you see some some calculations out there where, um, and Saudi Arabia has done, done a lot of the heavy lifting as they as they almost always do. But there's been times and, and months where they've been over 100 percent of compliance. Now, some of that is because of you know factors due to uh, supply constraints, whether it's again production that maybe shut in because of some fighting going on in the region, uh, you know, in northern Iraq, for example. But for the most part, they've been incredibly disciplined. And, it, and you know, suffice to say, those, those cuts have been working. And that's something that's – so they have worked, but can you help us kind of walk through what has been the impact? Could we hear that? And we see reports on it, but have we seen the market react in that way? Well, what's interesting now is you have this really kind of dynamic push and pull going on. You have OPEC and non-OPEC, mostly Russia, uh, participating in this 1.8 million barrel a day cut in production. Then at the same time, prices have moved up, and it's really opened the door. In fact, the door's kind of been kicked in for U.S. producers. So they've now had the opportunity to come in, boost production. Um, if you remember in 2016, the, the phrase that was uh, very popular when prices got down into the 30s was ducks. And those are drilled but uncompleted wells, Meanwhile, all those, which means basically all the work was done, all the do is kind of kind of do those last kind of finishing touches and we will have oil on the market and with prices going up into the you know upper mid to upper 50s those guys who had these ducks and producers in west texas for example uh they've gotten so much better at what they do so they've become able to break even at you know 50 dollars and less you know some of the best operators in the permian basin west texas say they could get by you know with prices in the mid and upper 20s um if you go back to 2014 20 2013, when this technology was relatively new, most of the break-even pricing you were reading about and hearing about was in the $70 area. So they've bring, brought that cost curve down tremendously over the last couple of years. And with prices in the, the mid and upper 50s in the U.S., it's given them the opportunity to increase production uh, and really kind of hedge some of this production and still make a profit. And that's why you're seeing a lot of uh, analysts predicting production reaching, topping 10 million barrels a day in the not-too-distant future. Okay. Well, that's some of the things you're talking about. Are You said geopolitical. They could affect us. They could affect prices. We saw a lot of things happen in 2017 that were devastating to the coast. Uh, when it comes to the hurricanes, we've seen the different storms. How did it react when those things happened in 2017, kind of the fall, summer of that year, as well as if something happened in the future? Have they learned from that? Will we be able to adjust quicker? What would you say uh, retailers as well as consumers should kind of keep an eye out on or, or what to, uh, what they experience? What are the learns from that? Right. And, and with the, the hurricanes that we learned in, in 2017 and really kind of any sort of hurricane or, or significant storm activity uh, in the past, we've learned that and, and we've been stressing this as Opus for a long time is that they're not necessarily supply destroyers as much as they are demand destroyers. When you think about it, you have a, a storm coming in. You have uh, this kind of quick burst of demand where uh, gasoline demand and, and to a lesser extent diesel as well, where uh, people fill up their cars in case they have to evacuate. You have first 
first responders filling up vehicles as well. Um, everyone's preparing for the storm. Well, once a storm comes through, if there's uh, significant flooding like we saw with, with Hurricane Harvey in Houston and the, and the Texas Gulf Coast, um, you know, cars get stuck. You know, they, they can't go anywhere. Roads are closed. That has an impact on demand. Obviously, stations get closed, too, if they ended up flooding out. So you see a real impact on demand. And whether that's Hurricane Harvey, which hit the Texas Gulf Coast in 2017, or Hurricane Irma, which went, which, uh, went through South, South Florida, um, the impact was on demand. Uh, the one difference between those two major hurricanes is, you know, and I know I said, you know, hurricanes tend to be more of a demand destroyer than a supply destroyer. Uh, Hurricane Harvey was certainly a demand or uh, supply destroyer. Uh, at its peak, there was probably about 25% of total U.S. refining capacity offline. Now, granted, obviously, the largest concentration of refining capacity in the U.S. is on the Gulf Coast. And with the you know, that, that area in, in the crosshairs of, of Hurricane Harvey, a lot of refineries had to shut down uh, as a result. And, and one thing they did do is they were very cognizant of where the storm was going, uh, and they shut down ahead of time. One of the things between differences between uh, Harvey and Katrina as well is, you know, again, no two are alike. Uh, Harvey had, you know, just heavy rains, flooding rains, but not nearly as much wind as, say, Hurricane Katrina did when it hit uh, Louisiana in, in 2005. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that was also different is, yes, both of them had flooding, but uh, Katrina also had about 20 feet of storm surge. So you know, no two storms are created the same. But one of the things that, that we did learn is that refiners were really uh, well aware of what Harvey was going to do, and they shut down ahead of time. And that's why a lot of the downtime refineries was measured in weeks and not months like it was during Katrina. Uh, during Katrina, you also had, like I said, a, a lot of wind and damage from from wind as well. So uh, that was some of the main differences. But I think you got to you take your hats off to refiners and say, you guys, you know, we're, we're really careful about their operations. And because of that, they were able to return to market and supply fuel uh, once again relatively quickly. And the downtime was measured, you know, just a couple of weeks instead of a couple of months. You know, I think, Denton, the other thing that was such a huge uh, improvement this uh, in the 2017 storm season was the coordination between government and industry. In order to do certain things to be able to maintain supply in the market, you need to get the government to waive certain requirements, uh, whether it be the Jones Act to be able to deliver tanker barges up the coast or something else, different ways to alleviate supply concerns and, uh, and enable the industry to get back on its feet. That coordination between industry and government in 2017 was, without a doubt, the most seamless operation I've ever seen. Absolutely. Would it would certainly agree there. And again, whether you lean left, lean right, lean down the middle, whatever, uh, there was a lot of coordination and everyone was, you know, it seemed like every step of the way, everyone was well informed. In fact, you know, RVP waivers were issued for, uh, I believe the final count was, I think, uh, 30 different states. And obviously, because the Gulf Coast is such a huge supplier of fuel to, you know, a large chunk of the country, uh, the fact that, you know, all these states were given waivers just to make sure or people had fuel for, for their cars, you know, and, and trucks and, and what have you, um, you know, it was, was a lot of coordination. They did a great job with it. And again, you know, if you want to take your hats off to refiners, you probably have to take it off to, to the government, too, for coordinating this so well and making sure, you know, people had had fuel. Uh, you know, obviously, some stations that lost power, um, you know, were an issue. But again, you know, that's probably something beyond, uh, you know, control of, of some, you know, of some of the more local government. But again, when people needed fuel, uh, the government did their best to make sure it was there, uh, you know, during these storms. As a recovering lobbyist, I get a little uneasy when we start saying, let's compliment the government. But I think you're right on this one. <laughs> um, but, you know, we mentioned it's not left, right. It's not uh, fuel supply and fuel price is not a political issue. It affects everybody. And so at the end of 2017, oil, whether it was West Texas or Brent, was right on 60 bucks a barrel. Um what we found is <clears throat> when oil goes up, alternatives gain attention. We just released right. a survey through the Fuels Institute which showed that interest in hybrid vehicles dropped from 82% of consumers to less than 50% of consumers because gasoline prices dropped from like, 375 to 225. Um, so that kind of that spurs interest in alternatives and really you know when oil prices are low, it hurts alternatives from gaining market share. 
everybody has the question and I always have the question and you're in a position where as a part of Opus, you can help provide some guidance. Where does oil go? Is oil going back to eighty hundred dollars? Is it dropping down? Um, what is the uh, the forecast look like for twenty eighteen, even in twenty nineteen? Well, I think you're starting to see a lot of, uh, you know, we, we've talked about in the past that we're kind of stuck in this uh, 40 to $60 range, at least for WTI. And in the case of Brent, probably a few dollars more, maybe $4 more. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we're going to kind of stick for 2018 towards the upper end of that range. I do think we're going to have probably a, a, a little bout above $60 for WTI and probably above $70 for Brent. I think those are going to be short-lived because you're going to find, uh, one, if it's still happening during OPEC agreement to cut production, uh, Brent at seventy dollars, you know, kind of makes it rise a little wide and say, hey, we could we could flip in a couple extra barrels here, and then at the same time, it just unleashes the, um, you know, the the beast that is West Texas with with the amount of production they have and how quickly they could turn that on. One thing, the difference between and get into this real quick, um, the difference between producing oil on in, say, West Texas or North Dakota or even some of those places in Oklahoma uh, versus the Gulf of Mexico is the, the lead time you need. Uh, for example, these, these projects in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, it really takes kind of about seven years before oil from when it's first discovered to when it reaches the market. In the case of some of these shale producers, it's about seven months. So the, the, the reaction in production could be a lot quicker when you're, when you're dealing with the, the shale oil play. Um, so with prices moving up, again, it just kind of really kind of gives them the opportunity to come in there and be kind of that um, incremental supplier to, uh, you know, kind of calm prices down. And I think that's why you're going to see the U.S. become a bigger part of the export pool uh, in, in 2018 and, and beyond. I mean, there's been times in the late 2017 where you've seen uh, oil exports top uh, 2 million barrels a day. And we estimate that there's probably total capacity to export oil at about 3 million million barrels a day. And I think what you're going to see going forward is companies look at uh, more infrastructure to to export oil. Uh, and that's just out the market. So that's going to take a little time. But again, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's hard to, to envision a scenario where we're back up to the 80 to 90, $100 a barrel area without something happening that you, that you can't predict. Well, you know, with all that unpredictability and maybe we're a little nervous. Does this mean as we are hearing that the internal combustion engine is gone? Should I go buy my EV and kind of just not worry about uh, liquid fuels at all? What are your thoughts? I don't, th- I don't think that's that's quite the case yet. I think we're, we're still in, a, in an era of, of kind of low oil prices, especially compared to the beginning of this decade when prices were easily over $100 a barrel. Um, obviously, that's going to make it difficult for electric vehicles and, and alternative vehicles because, John, like you mentioned before, uh, when, when oil prices are higher, that's when these 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 become these alternative technologies become a lot more active. Um, you know, as far as the electric vehicles are concerned, I think they're going to be part of the mix going forward. Forward, particularly as um, you know, governments look to ban them, and, and you know, California looks to go away from the internal combustion engine, and some of these European countries. So, uh, but even at these, these prices, it just you know, with oil prices where they are, are gas retail gasoline prices probably forecast to go a little bit higher next year in, in 2018, but probably not much higher than what they've been at in, in 2017. Uh, you know. I think the, the, the juice is not worth the squeeze, if, if, if you will. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting. And, you know, we're not going to get into the onion that is global policies with regards <laughs> to EVs and everything because <clears throat> I can spend a couple hours uh, pontificating on that subject. But I think the bottom line I see is global markets and from the economic standpoint – aren't really tilting in a direction that's going to inherently encourage consumers to grab these alternatives, Donovan. I think what we're seeing is that the economics is not the incentive driving this, which means the government's going to have to step in, whether it be domestically or overseas. This teeter-totter between government action and consumer reaction, because if there's a policy to promote non-liquid fuel engines <clears throat> and you do, you reduce demand for liquid fuel, that means liquid fuels – because supply is strong, demand's petering will go down in price, which means consumers will be going, okay, so Mr. Government, you're telling me to do this, to buy this non-liquid fuel, but I can go buy gasoline for buck twenty-five a gallon. Right. What are you doing to me? And I think that balance is going to probably teeter-totter for the next 20, 30 years in my guess. What do you think? 
Yeah, no, and I and I totally agree with you. That's a that's a two hour podcast for another time. But again, I think I think you know if, if if liquid fuel demand goes down, obviously prices go go down. I mean, obviously when what we do, there's a lot of factors that go into to the, the way prices move and and direction of price. But at the end of the day, supply and demand is what really matters the most. Um, and if again, if if demand is dropping, then then prices supply is going to go higher. Prices are going to drop alongside it, and People are going to say, like you said, John, people are going to be like, hey, I could get gasoline for, you know, less than two dollars, which didn't happen all that which wasn't happening all that long, which was happening all, not all that long ago. You know, you're, you're looking at a situation where people are going to gravitate to whatever the cheapest source of energy is. And I think that's kind of been something that has always been the case, particularly in America, as you know, we feel like, uh, you know, we're we're uh, it's a God given right for us to have uh, or birthright to have cheap fuel um, and cheap energy. And and again, I think the shale revolution has kind of created a little bit of that for the U.S. Um, and is probably going to be one of the one of the factors going forward that'll keep prices from from getting too far uh, out of control and back up towards that hundred dollar a barrel level without some sort of global event that just are not going to see coming. Wow, well, we appreciate it, Denson. You know, before we wrap up here, I just wanted to ask you one question, just to see where can retailers find out more about what's happening in the upcoming years, more about where you're going to be speaking at. Where can they get information on that? Sure. Well, you can always visit our, our website, opusnet.com. Um, you know, myself and, and I know you guys mentioned Tom Closa before. Uh, we're, we're both on Twitter giving uh, insights that are, you know, hey, you know, we're human, so it's sometimes wrong. But uh, I'm, uh, my Twitter's at Cinco70Denton and Tom's is at Tom Closa. Uh, now at Opus, we're doing a little bit more blogging, so there's a little bit more free material out there. And also, we're doing, we're starting to work on a uh, an outlook for 2018 that looks kind of, you know, kind of a across the barrel, whether it's uh, we start at oil and we make our way downstream with refinery operations, some predictions for what we think prices will do in, in, the, in the coming year, as well as, uh, you know, kind of retail averages and, and some of the other things, to, the big picture things to look out for in the, in the new year. All right. Well, Denton, thank you very much. We always appreciate your support and your insight. And uh, we look forward to having you again on another episode of Convenience Matters. And for you guys out there, if you want more information, reach out to fuelsinstitute.org. Donovan or myself will be happy to help set you up some more information about where the market is heading. Have a good one. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nets and produced in conjunction with Human Factor Media. For more information, visit convenience.org.